Matthew 28, 17 through 20, and Acts 1, 8. And I do that to show an emphasis on the different details, because Matthew is approaching it from one direction, and Luke is approaching it from another. And the bottom line there is that while they're coming from different directions, they're uh, or they're emphasizing different details, I should say, they are both sharing the same direction. Uh, they're, they're headed in the same direction, and that is to get the Church involved in the Great Commission. The Church is shown to be a witness in these two passages. Uh, believers like you and me, everybody, uh, are both given responsibility for and we are participating in the Great Commission, but unlike the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we are also given the indwelling permanent presence of the triune God and his power to ensure we carry it out. Again, not perfectly, but adequately. Yeah, we messed that up too. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Huh. It hurts, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I'm sitting here like, man, that's me. But God still uses our mess ups. Right, right. Which is amazing. And, and what, yeah, what looks like failure on our part, I mean, okay, so Jesus gets grabbed and arrested and beaten and crucified, right? Everybody thought failure. So yeah. how, how often does that happen? Because, you know, how much more so does that happen? Because we are just human. We're not God and human. Right. We're just human. Right. Um, we do have the Holy Spirit in us, who's hopefully moving us in the right direction, but we are still going to fall short. We're going to mess up. Uh, we're going to make mistakes. We are still going to struggle with sin. And yet, God can use all that to his glory. He leverages it somehow. I mean, this is part of the mystery of Christ in you. But in the end, it's not that we need to just lean back and say, oh, it's no big deal. God's got it. Right. Um, it is to say, let's, you know, if, if I'm aware that I messed up, I need to repent. And maybe in doing that, I am showing humility to my neighbor to whom I messed up in front of and asking him for his forgiveness. And, you know, maybe that's the the doorway through which that person enters the kingdom because they're like, okay, dude, I'm familiar with people messing up. I'm not used to people asking for forgiveness. Yeah. Hmm. You're right about that one. You know, you mentioned in your essay, David, that there's a type of communicative union. So what would be mm -hmm. a, a communicative union? What is that? Okay. So communicative union is essentially what generally we call union with Christ, uh, participation in Christ, the transforming of a believer from the inside out that results from the presence and power of God the Holy Spirit. It's the result of Christ's initiative. It's not because we are studying Scripture so much and we're so much in prayer that God's like, you are so awesome, and so I'm going to draw you deeper. No, it really is, again, it's not an ontological change to humanity, but in my essay, I said uh, we are given ontological clarity. So if, uh, if union with Christ is our new state of relating to Jesus, then being in Christ, um, the already and not yet, whereby we are saved and we are being saved and we are seeking to live for God's glory through Christ at work in us through the Holy Spirit, then being in Christ is who elected humanity was meant to be. So, you know, this, this being in Christ while it's kind of the, our situation, the Christian situation, the church's relationship with God on this side of Jesus' second coming, it's not like we're going to suddenly graduate into a different state. We will, in a sense, always be in Christ, because even Adam and Eve were created to be in Christ. So we, we, with this ontological clarity, we understand being in Christ is what it truly means to be human. Now, that's not to say that we should look on the lost as being subhuman. I'm, I'm not saying that at all, because we don't know who is going to come to saving faith and who isn't. We should look at every single person we meet as a potential person who is lost and is going to be found. 
there's not to be any sort of, this is not a, a backdoor towards discriminating against people who reject the gospel. It, it's to say, really, more importantly, that the results of God's divine communication to us is more than just a change in going from sinner to saint. It is to say that our lives, because of what Christ has communicated to us through the Holy Spirit, is that God is, it, it demonstrates what God's doing in the world, um, doing, in, doing in creation, and, and doing in us as individuals who are elect in Christ. But, and this is where I want to come back to the other things I talked about, it has to be built upon a Trinitarian foundation. It has to be done within a covenantal framework. See, all three things are necessary for, for this model to be properly appropriated by us. Hmm. So, mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. And then um, what's more, if, I, if you don't mind me Go ahead. elaborating here, what's really important is that not just Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which are, you know, if you're a, a Bible-believing Christian, of course you're going to be like, yeah, those are important. But what often gets the short shrift is Jesus' ascension. You know, that not only is that making sure that all of Christ's benefits come to us, you know, those benefits come to us through the giving of the Holy Spirit. And then on top of that, Jesus is before the Lord intervening for us, interceding for us. Um, So all these things work back to God using us. You know, he gives us the Holy Spirit through which our union with Christ is forged so that we can participate in and continue on the ministry of Jesus in the world that happens in and through our lives, through our living witness, not just our words and sharing the gospel, but embodying the the gospel, Hmm. demonstrating how the gospel has changed our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now for the the last Westminster Confession of Faith uh, statement I want Mm -hmm. to talk about. I want to take a look at chapter 26. I guess you call this bullet point three or section three. Um, yeah, but you look at 26 is basically the fellowship of the saints. And what Mm -hmm. I, what I love about the last section of your article, the communicative union is that you encompass all of chapter 26 in this article and Mm -hmm. it's very clear. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read what chapter 26.3 states. Please. All right. It says that this communion, which the saints have with Christ in no way means that they share in his Godhead or are equal with him in any respect to affirm either is in, uh, in, well, <laughs> impious, impious. Thank you. Or in blasphemous. Mm-hmm. Neither mm-hmm. does their communication with their, with each other take away or infringe the right. Each person has to own and possess goods and property. You know, Mm -hmm. so I've been looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith pretty heavy lately, Mm -hmm. especially when I became an ordained elder. And when -hmm. when you're looking at the Fellowship of the Saints, a couple months ago, back in April, I did a housewarming party, you know, with my church family. And I, Mm. in in a sense, opened up my home. And I am sharing my home with believers, with Saints. I'm fellowshipping with the saints that I, you know, worship God with. And right. looking at chapter 26 on that, when it talks about the fellowship of the saints, it's not just this, oh, we go to church and we worship God and then we go home and we don't see each other for a whole week. No. <laughs> right. That's if if a church member is sick and you have to go out on a Wednesday night, you know, you're getting out of your bed or you are going early in the morning and you're meeting other people that you attend the same building with, if you will, yeah. you want to meet this person, you go and fellowship with this sick person and you are showing the kingdom of God and, and it's on display vividly, mm-hmm. you know, and I, mm-hmm. I could be interpreting this wrong, but when I read this passage or this section from the Westminster confession of faith, that's what speaks light to me is that when I see that, when I see fellow Christians coming together and fellowshipping together, mm-hmm not just on Sundays, but throughout the entire week, 365 days out of the year, that is God's kingdom. That is his communicative union on display, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, Well, and that's the heart of the whole chapter. 
and I think, you know, it's really important that Christians, whether we're in Louisiana or Pennsylvania, in North America or Africa, I mean, this speaks to us all. And, you know, there's a great book that came out several months ago by Rosaria Butterfield called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And her her point, if I could possibly sum it up in a, a sentence or two, is that uh, exactly what you're getting at, that we need to open up our lives and our homes to other Christians. And I'm amazed at how many churches there are where you've got Christians who have never been in one another's homes. Yeah. I mean, it's sad. It, it is a sad commentary on the state of relationships in that church. And, you know, I think we as elders, whether ruling elders or teaching elders, we have a responsibility to do everything we can to model that for people that we are called to serve as under shepherd. And so the bottom line there is everything I have belongs to Christ. Amen. And so I need to really think about how am I using what God's blessed me with for his glory? And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I struggled to come to grips with that in the sense that it, for many years, it wasn't even on my radar, I'm embarrassed to say. So I think that as, you know, I get a new car, I need to be thinking, how am I going to use this car for God's glory? <laughs> You know, so so for instance, I was visiting a guy who is not a formal member of our church. He he actually lives catty corner across the street from from Round Hill, the church building. And I had run into him a, a month or two ago, and he was like, "Hey, haven't seen you in a while. Why don't you come over and uh, you know, I'll bring you up to speed." And I'm like, "Hey, great." So I, I went over there a week or two ago, and he proceeded to tell me how he had had a heart attack recently and had stints put in and then he uh got diagnosed with a form of leukemia oh my goodness and was on this medication that seemed to be doing pretty well and then all of a sudden he wasn't feeling great again and how he was really scared and and all that well long and short in the conversation i said listen bob you know if you he, he had said to me that he was worried about even having the strength to drive to his doctor's appointments and i said well listen if your wife is unavailable to drive you please call me and I would be willing to drive you. I'd be happy to drive you. And and if for some reason I truly can't, I will find somebody who can drive you. And he was kind of blown away by that. He's like, you would? I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. But I mean, I think we we need to try and prayerfully cultivate that kind of attitude. You know, if I can put a plug in for my wife real quick, she is awesome at this. That's her natural default setting is to invite people into our, not just our homes, but into our lives. And, you know, she, she had to learn a long time ago. I need to ask <laughs> Dave's permission before I do that. And, and she still forgets to do that sometimes. So um, we often drive to church to worship separately because I got to get there a whole lot earlier, but you know, before we split up and ride home separately, she'll sometimes come up to me. Uh, oh, I'm really sorry. I invited so-and-so over for lunch. Is that okay? And I'm like, you know, I, I learned to say a long time ago, that's awesome, honey. And you know, I, cause quite honestly, I'm an introvert. I may not sound like it on the phone and God has actually equipped me to, to find joy in an extrovert world. But I truly know I'm still an introvert at heart because I come home after worship and Sunday school on Sundays, and I am just wiped out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand Eric Little's words. You know, he, he told his sister, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Well, when I preach, I feel God's pleasure, but I also feel all that energy going out of me. <laughs> um, so when people are coming home, coming over to our house for lunch after worship and Sunday school, it forces me to, to have to turn to the Lord and ask him for energy or else I'm just a bump on the log. And they're like, what's wrong with you, pastor? Are you really, are you so upset that we came over? You know, I mean, nobody's ever said that to me and I've hopefully have never looked that way, but I mean, that's what it comes down to. So, you know, it, to, to look at chapter 26, the fellowship of the saints and, and uh, subset number three, um, 
that's important to our discussion overall because it's not like we are becoming the fourth member of the Godhead. We are not 